Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Good morning. And just so you know, I will take, you can ask questions during the presentation, but I do request that you try to keep them more general than specific to your own situation. So, tax planning and strategies. Now, as, we all, as uh, everyone knows that two years ago, <clears throat> there was a very big event, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Now, the dates I'm gonna show you all happened in 2017. So this bill was first introduced into the House of Representatives on November 2nd. The way the federal government works, any tax legislation has to start in the House of Representatives in the committee known as Ways and Means. They are the ones who determine the budget. They are the ones who determine the spending in the country for the federal government. So this bill was first introduced on November 2nd. And then, two weeks later, 14 days later, it actually passed. It was then introduced into the Senate 12 days later on November 28th, and on December 20th it passed. Now, why did it take so long to get from the House to the Senate? Well, in the meantime, there were two other things that happened, you know, between December, November 16th and December 20th. Well, first of all, uh, the holiday of Thanksgiving, and everybody takes that week off, especially Congress. You know, Congress has a lot of time outside of Washington. They only work four-day weeks. It's either Monday to Thursday or Tuesday to Friday. And then they're home on the, and then on the weekends, most of them go home. Uh, there actually was a um, local member of the House who passed away several years ago and an interview, he gave an interview shortly before he passed away. And he said one of the biggest problems with Congress was the development of the jet engine. Because now everybody could go home on the weekend. You know, most of the, before that, they pretty much stayed in Washington. You know, we see a lot of, we hear a lot of divisiveness in Washington. We hear a lot of attacking the other side because it's a lot easier to attack somebody, to caricaturize them, if you don't know them. If they're staying in Washington, well, then they're spending evenings and weekends together. You get to know each other. It's a lot easier to work with people when you know them than that. So you had Thanksgiving, plus also, you may recall back in 17, just as we had recently, there is the threat, there was a threat of a government shutdown. Remember, the government either passes a budget for, the, for a fiscal year, or if they don't do that, what they do pass is what's known as CRs, or continuing resolutions, which basically says, here's enough money to go from now until July. Then comes July, they pass another one that gives them till September and so forth. But this bill went from the House to being signed into law in 50 days. It is extremely rare that any legislation passes in seven weeks. For those who, may, for those who were around back in the mid 80s when we had our last major overhaul, which was 1986, they worked on it for a couple of years. And then once they passed it, it didn't go into effect right away. It was another year before it went into effect. This bill passed at the end of 17 and went into effect immediately. So the returns we prepared for 17 were very different from the returns they got prepared for 2018. And we will go into that during this presentation. So the impact of this tax bill, HR1. Okay, first of all, there were corporate tax changes and individual tax changes. The corporate tax changes are permanent, in other words, this is done. The individual tax changes were only for eight years through 2025. However, that's for now. Why do I say for now? Because, well, what's going to happen next year? Another election. Another election. We're electing a somebody for the office of president. We're electing the entire House, which we do every two years. We're re-electing one-third of the Senate. Okay? So, a new Congress, a new, if you have a new executive in the Oval Office, if you have a new change, if you have a shift in the breakdown of Congress, there could always be future tax changes. For example, uh, everybody here remembers that in 2003 there were a series of tax cuts that were good for eight to ten years. Well, they were set to expire. Congress extended them for one year, they extended them for a second year, and then they made all those tax changes permanent as well. And that's what we were working with up until this tax legislation. So, corporate tax changes. First of all, prior to 2018, as you can see there, 
we had eight tax brackets. So it was, and this is what's called for a C corporation. Does everybody know the difference between a C corporation and S corporation and a partnership? Anybody not? Please, okay. Very simply, on the federal level, if you are a C corporation, the corporation pays tax on the federal level. So that's companies like GM and IBM and AT&T. They are corporations. So when they make distributions to their shareholders, dividends, that money gets taxed twice because if AT&T shows a profit, they have to pay tax on that profit. They distribute part of that profit to their shareholders in the form of dividends. The shareholder has to pay tax on that as well. So that money gets taxed twice. So then you also have what's known as the subchapter S corporation, which is for small, closely held businesses. There are rules and requirements as to whether or not you are eligible to be a subchapter S corporation. But with an S corporation, there is no federal income tax. You still get a tax return, but the shareholders get what's known as a K-1 form, which shows their share of the profits. Now that is determined specifically on the percentage of ownership. Then you have the unincorporated businesses. That's a partnership. A partnership is two or more people. So, uh, Bao, right? So, if Bo, I'm sorry, Bo. If Bo and I get together as a business and we form a partnership. Uh, that's all. We file a separate return on that. And the partnership profit and loss, it can be if it's two people, 50 50. If it's three people, it can be a third, a third, a third. But you can have an agreement that says it doesn't have to be strictly on a percentage basis of ownership. You could have three people, for example, and they decide that one person is going to be handling all the back-to-back -back, uh, administrative minutia, day-to-day -day operations, so they decide that person is going to get 40 percent and the other two people are going to get 30 percent with a partnership that can be. And then you also you have the LLC, the Limited Liability Company, which is also an unincorporated entity. Again, if you have two people or more, it is a partnership. If you just have one person in an LLC, a single member LLC, then you have to file that information for that business on Form 1040 Schedule C for an unincorporated business. So these were the prior tax brackets prior to 2018. Well, tax law, what did they do? From 2018 moving forward, if you are a corporation, you pay a flat 21%. Now, looking back at the rates here, now you see here the lowest rate was 15%. That was on the first $50,000 of income. So, a small corporation, still no more than $50,000 of income, does this bill help them or hurt them? Right, because they have to pay 6% more tax. Okay, so now, other changes. There, now, everybody here is familiar with alternative minimum tax? AMT, you hear more about it with individuals. I'll talk about that more. But there was also a corporate AMT, and that was repealed. Uh, code section 179. This is Internal Revenue Code section 179. This allowed, okay, everybody here is familiar with depreciation of, of equipment. Yes? Okay, depreciation is taken over the useful life, quote unquote, useful life of the equipment of whatever it is you purchase. That could be desks, that could be computers, that could be a telephone system, a copy, or whatever. Heavy machinery. There, the IRS has guidelines as to the quote unquote useful life and you write off the depreciation which is a non-cash deduction based on that information. However, section 179 allows you to take right off the piece of equipment purchase in its entirety, providing it is the year you buy it and place it in service. So in other words, you cannot buy the piece of equipment today, but it doesn't get delivered until January of next year and placed in service in January. You cannot take it this year, you can take it next year if you want to. This is an option. Now what they did here is they increased the purchasing up to one million dollars. So the first million dollars of equipment you can depreciate under section 179 in the first year. Now there are some guidelines requiring this. For example, you cannot use this code section to turn a profit into a loss. 
you do not have to write off the entire piece of equipment under Section 179. You might buy a $50,000 computer system, for example, but you may decide, hey, I'll take 25000 of that under Section 179, and the rest I will take under normal depreciation. It's always an option. Okay. <clears throat> now, I said you can buy it out up to a million dollars, but once you hit a certain amount of purchasing of equipment, then there is a phase out, and that phase out was raised up to two and a half million dollars. So you could take a mil up to a million dollars, but you couldn't buy more than two point five million dollars worth of equipment and place it in service. If you went over that, the two point five million, then that million dollars gets reduced slightly for every dollar you go over. <clears throat> and starting with 2018, these numbers of a million and 2.5 are getting indexed for inflation on an annual basis. But this is where we started for 18, so for 19, these numbers are up slightly. Dividends received. A corporation, just like anybody in this room, can buy investments. You can buy stock, it can buy stock, it can buy bonds, whatever. Now, under this, again, with the C Corporation, this refers to the C Corporation only, okay, up to 2017, you could take up to 80% of the dividends earned, of the income earned as dividends, and reduce, and take, write that off, again, reduce your income by that, up to 80% of the dividends received. Starting with 2018, that's been reduced to 65%. So, less is being allowed to be deducted, therefore, more, ta more potential taxable income there. Okay, net operating losses. Under the old law, you could, if you had a net operating loss this year, you would be allowed to either take it back or carry it forward. You could take it back up to three years. So in other words, if in 2015 you had, inco had income, in 2016 you had income, 2017 you had a loss, therefore paying no federal tax, you could take that loss, apply it against your 16, your 15, you could go back three years, up to three years, apply it against those years' profits and get money back from the federal government in the form of a refund. Or you could carry it forward for 15 years. Well, under the new law, the carry back is repealed, so it's now only carry forward, and you can, instead of being 15 years, you could carry it forward for up until the time that you use it up. Here's a big one for business. Okay, who here, does, and who here has their own business now? Please, show of hands. Okay, who does entertaining? Now, I'm not talking meals, I'm entertaining. Now, there's, there's meals and there's entertainment. Meal is in the restaurant. Entertainment is, for example, uh, Anybody here a hockey or a baseball or football fan? Football fan? Dolphins, Florida State, University of Florida? Okay, well, you could buy, in the past, the, your corporation, you could buy season tickets to any sporting, to any sports team, college or professional. You could take clients out and you could write that off as an expense called entertainment. Well, entertainment is no longer deductible. So, take, so, anybody here planning to go to a Dolphins game in the next couple of weeks? No? That bad? Hey, the tickets are cheap. It's not as big. It's, the tickets are cheap then. You get them for five bucks. Anyway, so anyway, if you were, so, or going to the Florida Panthers hockey or the Miami Heat basketball. Okay, you buy the tickets. I take Bo, my client. Okay, the tickets I cannot write off as a business expense. However, I buy Bo a beer and a hot dog and a pretzel at the game. That's deductible. So the food, the re so going to the restaurant, buying the food at the arena, at the stadium, that's still deductible. But the ticket to get in there, that's not deductible anymore. Now meals, you still can deduct at 50%, and this also now includes in-house cafeteria or food brought in otherwise by the employer. They've added that in. Now, a lot of places they require, you know, employees cannot leave the premises. So a lot of businesses, they have a cafeteria or they have food brought in 
on a daily basis. I mean, uh, I am from New York originally, and I was pursuing something else before accounting, and I, ought, I supported myself by working as an office temporary. And I did a lot of work at J.P. Morgan, J.P. Morgan Investment Management. They provide a cafeteria for their employees. They allowed me, even though I, wasn't an, I, I was a temp employee through an agency, I was there for so long, they gave me lunch privileges. Now, for the regular employees who participated in the lunch plan, they got an extra 20 or $25 added to their pay. But then that money was deducted to cover the cost of the cafeteria. I got a free lunch, literally. A lot of fun. <clears throat> but moving on. So fringe benefits. Now, there are some various fringe benefits, transportation expenses, commuting equivalents. This was more so big up in New York, where people are more subject to using mass transit, like the railroad, buses, and so forth. A lot of companies would help their employees by covering part of the cost of that. Well, that is now no longer allowed, except for, of course, uh, safety concerns. Uh, there was another place I worked at, and this place was if you stayed late, past, you know, if you stayed after to get work done, if you were there till six, seven o'clock or later, they provided, a ca they provided a car service to take you to wherever you had to go, even if it was just, and again, using New York, even if it was just Penn Station or Grand Central Station to catch the Long Island Railroad or Metro North to uh, get home. Not bad. Okay. Now, that's corporate, and we'll, there's some more stuff we'll talk about corporate later, but now let's focus on individuals. Now, individuals, 2017, we had seven tax brackets, and these, are the, these were the rates. Now, remember, the individual rate is a graduated rate. So if you're in the 25% bracket, you paid the tax in the 10% bracket plus the tax of the 15% bracket. So if your income was between A and B, you paid 10%. If your income was between B and C, you paid the tax for A and B plus anything above B but not up to C. So it was a graduate. So it's not if you had $100,000 of income, you weren't paying, for example, a flat 25,000. You were paying the 10% 10, 10 bracket, the 15% bracket, and then whatever was above the 15, max it, before you max out at 25, you paid that amount. I'm not going to go into the dollar amounts. They as we all know, they change a little bit every year. Okay. Well, for 2018 to 25, for now these years, as we see here, we still have the 10% bracket. The 15 is now 12. 25 is 22, 28 is 24, and but more importantly, the top right, which was 39.6, is now down to 37 percent. Okay, so people are supposedly paying less in taxes, but are we really? <clears throat> I'm going to talk about that for some more. Okay, so standard deduction. Okay, now I brought in three years to show some examples of this. Okay, so. For 2017, who here is single? Anyone single? Okay, a couple people single. So if you were taking the standard deduction, remember, it's either the standard or the itemized. If your itemized deductions are greater than the standard, you get the itemized. Otherwise, you take the standard. So as we see here, in 2017, the standard deduction, if you were single or married filing separately, was $6,350. In 2018, it jumped up to 12,000. Why? Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. We'll get to that in a minute. 2019, it has gone up slightly. And we have the same thing here for a married couple filing jointly and also for head of household. As we can see here, it took a dramatic jump from 17 to 18. Okay? Now, if you're anyone here over 65, don't be shy. Okay? If, don't be afraid. It, hey, you're having a good run. Okay, but no. But if you take the standard deduction and you are over 65 or blind, or legally blind, they uh, allow you some additional uh, deduction, uh, increase the standard deduction. Now, exemptions. Everybody remember exemptions? Anybody here not remember? Well, see here, 2017, the exemption was $4,050. 2018, 2019, there is no exemption. Why? Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. They, as, as I put it, starting with 2018, they supersized the standard deduction. 
But the trade-off was, and, you, and everybody heard that, that the standard deduction was going to go up big time, which it did. What you did not hear in the media, or you heard very little of, was the fact that they got rid of the exemptions. Okay, so, <clears throat> who here is married? Don't be shy. Who's here is married? Come on. Okay. Okay. I'm going to give, here's an example I'm going to give. How, okay, how many kids do you have? <coughs> Two kids. Okay. Know anybody who's got four kids? No? Mo, you know somebody who's got four kids? So, four kids under the 2000, now remember, you got an exemption for everybody on the tax return. You, your spouse, and every dependent that you claim. That's, and I'll, you'll see why I'm going to four for a moment. What is 4,050 times six? $24,300, right? So, <clears throat> in 2017, if you were married with four kids, you got, let's just use the standard deduction for the moment, you got $12,700 plus $24,300, you had a $37,000 taking off your income, going from gross income to taxable income, from gross to adjusted gross to taxable, okay? Same situation starting in 2018, if you were just taking the standard deduction, all you got was $24,000. So therefore, for this couple with four kids, their taxable income just went up by $13,000. Now, that's again assuming they took the standard, but if they were able to itemize, remember, itemized deductions greater than the standard, you get the itemized. The Internal Revenue Code allows that if situation to choose between A and B, whichever one is more beneficial to the taxpayer is the one the taxpayer gets to take. So now, like for example, <clears throat> shifting from that, I have a client, a couple, they're uh, both, uh, six, uh, both over 65, very healthy income. Their two primary deductions were property taxes and they, had they have managed accounts the fees they paid for those managed accounts. Between everything, between that and taking the exemptions, they had about uh, $45,000 coming off their income. $45,000 between everything. For 2018, all they got was the uh, 24 plus the extra tw uh, 1300 each. They got 20, so their taxable income went up by $20,000. Okay, we're going to talk about this more. So now, we talked about standard versus itemized. So let's talk about itemized deductions right now. What are itemized deductions? They're very specific. Okay, first of all, <clears throat> first one is medical. Everybody has medical expenses. Okay, some of them are paid through your employer. We all have, we have health insurance. We have everything. Well, for, there was a, with the medical expenses, there is a threshold that you first have to meet. So, as I say with medical, everybody is starting in the basement and they got to get to the floor. Now, the floor for 2017 and 18 was 7.5%. So, that means if your income, your adjusted gross income was $100,000, 7.5% or $7,500 was what you had to spend first just to get to the floor. Then, anything above that you would be allowed to take item if you are able to itemize. Now remember, itemized deductions took a very big jump for everybody. So it makes it harder to take medical. Now what constant now, starting in 2019, that 7.5% threshold is now 10%. So now that hundred thousand, you gotta spend ten thousand dollars first. But remember, medical expenses and are subject to a double whammy because first you got to have enough medical expenses to exceed your threshold and then you got to have enough itemized deductions to be able to itemize and this law makes it harder for people to itemize so with medical let's keep going so that includes as I said health insurance premiums that's out of your pocket that is now remember that's the health insurance premiums not the premiums you pay pre-tax who here has health insurance through their place of employment? Okay, is it pre-tax or post-tax? Pre-tax, you can't take it as a deduction. If it's post-tax, that you can take. 
That also includes your co-pays for the prescriptions, for the doctors, for the hospital, going to a place to have your blood drawn or have x-rays taken and so forth. Okay, supplies, glasses, hearing aids, walkers. Uh, that also includes for people who are older and have other issues of, uh, I'll say this, uh, sanitary, uh, in con who are people who have plumbing, uh, shall we say plumbing issues? Uh, adult diapers, for lack of, no. That includes that. You laugh, but don't, you laugh, but seriously, it's not fun. It's not that fun, but all of that. Long-term care, that is all. Now, long-term care, that is a health insurance, but it's separate from your regular health insurance, and I'm going to show you why in a moment. Long-term care falls under a triple whammy. Remember I said, first with medical, first you have to reach the floor. Then you have to exceed, you have to exceed the floor. Then you have to have enough deductions to itemize versus standard. Long-term care, well, with long-term care, it doesn't matter how much your premiums are. How much you are allowed to deduct is strictly on your age. And they break it down in 10-year increments. So right now for 2019, for this year's returns, 19 returns, if you're under 40, for example, you might be paying $5,000 a year for long-term care. You can only take $290 as a deduction. If you're between 41 and 50, that goes up to $540. If you're 51, 60, $1,070. 61 to 70, $2,860. And if you're over 70, $3,570. This is the amount, doesn't matter how much you're paying, this is the amount you can claim as for medical purposes, for itemizing. Down here in Florida, as we know, there is a large older population. A lot of people who retired and came down here. They, uh, in many cases, they have very healthy income. Unfortunately, their physical health is terrible. So most of their income goes towards medical care. We have, we've had, we currently have some clients who live in a facility where nursing, nursing home, assisted living, where they get to deduct a percentage of their monthly payments. We have people who have, I'm sure we all know somebody who's had nursing care 24 hours, 24, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right Mo? We, know, we all know somebody. We have a lot of people in this. Note, remember, 2017 they introduced the first version of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, okay? One is they wanted to reduce the tax brackets down to four, and two, more importantly, with refer to medical, they wanted to eliminate the medical deduction in its entirety. The original version of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act wanted to get rid of all medical expenses whatsoever. Well, unfortunately, most people, younger, they don't have enough, they don't have enough, thankfully they don't have enough medical expenses, where they have to itemize and take a medical deduction. So are we thankful for that or are we unthankful for that? And if you're older, you may have still a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars of income between Social Security and pensions and investments, but most of that money is going towards medical care and therefore they don't pay any tax. So you tell me which is the better way. No one has an answer. Okay, taxes. This was a big one. Taxes have now been capped. This is state, I'm sorry, yeah, move on. Yeah, I'm sorry. This is now st in state income taxes or sales tax and property taxes. Florida is one of seven states that does not have an income tax. A number of years ago, Congress rectified or attempted to rectify this by giving people the option of either taking a deduction for their state income tax or a sales tax. Now, with regard to the sales tax, most people do not keep track of every receipt. So what they do is, based on your adjusted gross income, based on your local sales tax rate, Congress set a schedule that said this is what you can claim for sales tax. However, they did put in a provision that if you buy large ticket items, things that you do not normally buy on a regular basis, that you could add the sales tax to the, of that to what they allow you to take. So for example, uh, anybody buy a car every year? No? 
Anybody buy a car or everybody, does everybody lease? Who buys a car? Anybody? Okay. If you buy a car, you can take the sales tax. If you buy a new furniture, you can take the sales tax. These are things you do not buy on a regular basis. So if anybody was holding off on buying a hang glider or a hot air balloon or their own private jet and they're holding off because they wouldn't get any benefit from it, well, they can now get a benefit from it. They can deduct the sales tax in the year they buy it. Charitable contributions, pro up to 2017, you could make donations equivalent to 50% of your adjusted gross income, fully deductible. With the new bill, it's now 60% of your adjusted gross income. So if anybody is really giving, you know, you can give a little bit more. But that's really more, but that really applies more to, I think, the people who are, uh, shall we say, in the seven and eight figure income range. Nobody here? Yes. Not yet? <laughs> You're working on it, Jessica? No, all of us. We're all working on it, of course. So, mortgage interest. That's still allowed. Now, originally, it's now on only the first $750,000 of mortgage indebtedness. But if you had a mortgage greater than that prior to this bill going into effect, you were grandfathered in. So you could still take the full deduction because... Uh, the mortgage interest, it said existing mortgage up to a million dollars. That was the that was the threshold. Uh, Seven fifty was the compromise because again, in the first version of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, they wanted to reduce the mortgage indebtedness only on the first half million dollars. But it was from one million to half million. They met in the middle. Seven fifty, and home equity lines. Who here has a home equity line? Okay. Home equity lines, remember, home equity lines. People take a home equity line to consolidate other debt they could not deduct. Prior to 1986, you could deduct personal interest. Since 86, you could not. But people run up credit cards, they buy a car, they buy things for the house, they have home improvements done. They get out the home equity line and they consolidate everything into the home equity line. That interest was deductible. Well, now it's not unless... It is specifically for a home improvement. So if you get a home equity line to consolidate some credit cards, you cannot take the interest. If you have a home equity line and you take money out to replace the roof, to redo the kitchen, redo the bathroom, rewire the house, that's fully deductible. Alimony. Anybody here divorced? No. No one? Anybody, no one, anybody here contemplating divorce? Anybody here know somebody? who was divorced, is getting divorced, is contemplating divorce. Nobody? Okay, well under the old law, uh, prior to 2018, alimony was deductible by the payer. So, Bo, you're married, right? Yeah. How long have you been married? 20 years. Okay, so if you got divorced prior to, two, if, you, if you had gotten divorced prior to the end of 2017, you could deduct the al alimony payments to your ex-spouse, come off your income, she has to pick it up on hers. Okay, well the new law, which went to, the new law says after, so that started with this year, 2019, if anybody gets divorced now and you're paying alimony, the person paying the alimony cannot deduct the alimony, the recipient does not pick it up as income. So if, you, if, so if somebody was getting divorced, got divorced, and they had to pay $3,000 a month, well, that's $36,000 a year in alimony. Well, now that $36,000 is being taxed at a higher rate because the person paying it has the money. The person getting it doesn't have the money. This also applies to, mortgage, to uh, alimony modifications. If anybody is in an existing settlement prior to 2019, and now in 2019 they went to court to get it changed, they went to get it reduced, their income is down, they can't afford to pay the $3,000 a month. And let's say the court agrees with them and knocks it down to $1,500. Okay, it went down from $36,000 to $18,000. Okay, well, now that $18,000 they can't deduct it anymore. And their ex-spouse doesn't have to pick it up as income anymore either. 
How's that? <clears throat> so again, who is that helping? Who is that hurting? The money is still taxable, but now it's going to be taxed at the higher rate. Now, last thing, and again, anybody have any questions on any of this? Not yet? Okay. Last thing I want to talk about, <clears throat> okay, does this, look familiar? does this look familiar to anybody? Yes. 2000, this was the 2018 tax return. Now remember, the 2017 return, the Form 1040, was two full pages long. Okay? Had all the information. What did they do? Well, this will go back a number of years, but going back to the mid-80s, you had several Republicans talking about making the tax return a postcard or postcard sized. Uh, well, they came up with half page. And as you can see here, the first page has basically just all your information, you, your address, your dependents, and your signature block. And on the second page, you have all the income items, or some of them. For the items uh, that did not make this page, they created six schedules for that information. So if you look here, over here, line one, that's your wages. Line two is your interest. Line three is your dividends. Then you have your pensions and IRAs income information. And then, your, and then line five was your social security. Just those five lines. But people have other income. You have people with capital gains. You have people who had gambling winnings that they have to report. That all went on another schedule. And then what they said was, okay, you take that schedule, add up those lines, and that amount would go here on this little line here on the left. See that? And you see line, the line right next to it on line six? You added up the first five lines plus that line, and that's what went on that line. So it's a little confusing, right? And then the same thing with deductions, same thing. Well, this is the 2018. Well, they have modified the return again for 2019. And actually, this was actually a good modification. <coughs> As you can see, it is now not a, it's not a full page. It's not a half page either. But one thing it does put to rest now and forever is the idea of a postcard tax return. Now the funny thing is, is that they made in 2018 the tax return, the 1040, half a page. Page one, page two is each half a page. The schedules roll no more than half a page long. All the other schedules, the Schedule A, the Schedule B, the Schedule C, the Schedule D, the 8949, the 6251, all the other forms were still a full page. Does that make any sense to anybody? No, not at all. Okay. But as you can see here now, going back to the 2019, if you look here, They've put the signature block back on page two. They have moved the income items back to page one. And now everything adds straight down. So if you look here, on this line here, you have wages, interest, dividends, IRAs, pensions, Social Security. And then this line here is everything from Schedule One. It now is straight down addition. Then over here, you have your standard or itemized deduction. And then you have over here uh, your qualified business income. Does anybody know what Q qualified business income is? Anybody heard of it? Show of hands, does anybody know what it is? QBI? This is something that they created for business owners only. If you own a business, no, uh, this is for S corporations and partnerships you are allowed to take up to 20% of the profit and use that as an additional reduction of your income. There are formulas that come into play. If you're above a certain threshold, you don't, if you're below a certain the first threshold, it doesn't matter, you get it. If you're above the first threshold, there are calculations to determine how much of it you get, and then there is a second threshold, and if you're above that, there are other calculations, but for the most part, if you're above that second threshold, you do not get it at all. Also, that was designed for what they call SSTBs, Service Specified Trade or Business. So, for example, this was also designed 
that if your business is based on your reputation, so for example, my firm is Fishman Associates. My last name is Fishman. So if my income is very high, I would not be allowed because it's based on my reputation. My business is based on my knowledge, my reputation, my clients returning to me and new clients coming to me. Hi, Bo. <laughs> uh, no, but, ser but seriously. But if you're below the first threshold, it doesn't matter. You get it regardless. Whole thing to go through, it's very complicated. More than needs to be gone through here. But you have all your items. I'm sorry. Yes, Jessica. You can give us an example, say a person who's making a hundred thousand. If you're on, well for two thousand, uh, well for 2018, for a single individual, if your gross income was under 150, SSBD, if your gross in, if your income was below 157.5, 157,500 dollars, mm -hmm. and let's say you had a, a K1, you had, a, you had a, an S corporation, you, got a, you had your W2, and you got a K1 for $20,000. If you're below that 157.5 for a single individual who's single, they could take 20% of that $20,000, $4,000, add that with their standard or itemized deduction and reduce their income. For a couple filing jointly for 2018, that was $315,000. And then there was a fifty or hundred thousand dollar gap from the first threshold to the second threshold. So for a single individual, one fifty seven five to two oh seven five. For a married couple, three fifteen to four fifteen. If you were above that second threshold, it was highly likely that you would not get any advantage of that. And there have been some issues with this QBI deduction, which as an organ the organization I represent, we have spoken with Congress about. This past year, they came out with some technical corrections to make it easier to understand. See, one of the things about this Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is that it went into effect immediately with the following year's tax return. In 86, when they passed the bill back then, it didn't go into effect immediately. There was a year, there was a year gap. So they passed it in 86. It didn't go into effect until 88. So the return, yes, Jessica. Yeah, so your point is that if the person who has W-2 or 1099 or both, W-2 and 1099, so with this SSBT, which is also you called the uh, QBI, I would imagine that the QBI is a SAP IRA, simplify IRA, SAP IRA. So allow the business owners to take a full advantage of tax deduction if it's a service related. So 25% per year, four years, that's 100%. Am I right? Do I well, it's 20%. 20%. 20%. 20 percent. 20 percent. But remember, it's only 20 percent of the income that year, yeah. and it's not all your income; it's just from the K1. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if the person is 1099, well, that now that's a schedule. So that would apply to a Schedule C also. Yes. Yeah, and also if they have a profit. Uh huh. Yeah, and also, and uh, uh, continuously in the service business, like your service business, like us, service business. So 20 percent. Per year deduction, five years, that's like 100%. You can interpret that way, perhaps. You could, but I would not. I'm just, I, I 20% would not. per year. Deduction. Well, up to 20% yeah. per year. Yeah. So if the, if the business shows, like I said, if you qualify for it and your K-1 is $20,000 this year, you get $4,000. Mm -hmm. If next year your business, the profit is $30,000, you get $6,000. Yeah. A, a simple way that I interpret it is that, say, if you make 100000 from your W two versus a person B make a hundred thousand from ten ninety nine. So the ten ninety nine, the QBI SSBT service level and uh, the adjusted gross income is eighty thousand versus the W two is a hundred thousand. Taxable income. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Plus other deduction. Right. So W two is hundred thousand. Hundred thousand. But K one say ten ninety nine business owner is eighty thousand to start with. In theory, yes. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So, this is the form that's going to be coming out for this year when you get your return done. Now, is there anybody here who is um, over 65? Come on, don't be shy. Don't be shy. Don't be. We got one. Well, they created another form specifically for you. Well, for people over 65, it is called the 1040 SR. Would you like to see it? Okay. See this? This is the 1040. This is the 1040 SR. 
You know what the difference is? They made it bigger so you can see it. Yes, <laughs> exactly. It's a bi it is a bigger font. So page one, page two, page one, page two, they are the same. The only difference is, is that on page one, look down here, can you see here? Can you see what the, over here where I'm pointing? That is the standard deduction chart. That is for seniors who are going to take the standard deduction. They tell you if you are single, married jointly, or a qualifying widower, head of household, married separately, depending on how many boxes up here you check off, this is your standard deduction. But that's only for seniors. What? Yes, we do. Well, that's well. But that's only for people who are, that's basically for seniors who are going to be doing their tax returns on their own. So, again, this puts to bed once and for all, there will never again be the concept of a postcard tax return. You hear talk every now and then about scrapping the entire code altogether. They talk about going to a VAT, a value added tax, or a national sales tax on everything. Will not happen. Even, and I've heard this from the IRS, that even if that were to happen, they have enough work to keep themselves busy under the old tax law for 20 years. But in all likelihood, that will not happen. That has not happened here. It's not expected to happen. Every now and then you hear talk about that. Now, but let's go back to all of this. And as we see, changes in the tax law, <clears throat> how they have an effect on us. One of the other offsets of this was because they reduced the brackets, and we're going to go all the way back to that. Here we go. As you see, they reduced the various tax brackets. What was one of the other big changes that happened because of that? Uh, who here gets a sal Who here works, draws a salary? Come on, show of hands. Don't be shy. Okay. Did you notice that during this past last year, when this happened, that all of a sudden you were getting a little bit more money in your paycheck? Anybody notice that? No? Didn't notice that? Well, one of the big changes was because they reduced the tax brackets is they re the IRS had to modify the withholding tables. You know, when you go to a job, you fill out the W-4 form, which is your name, your address, your social security number, your withholding status, the number of exemptions you're claiming, okay? Based on that information, based on how often they issue payroll, whether it is daily, weekly, every other week, twice a month, monthly. Based on that information, that tells the employer how much money they need to withhold during the year or during the pay period. You always have the option of going to your employer and saying, I want more withheld, but this is how much they must withhold and it is based strictly on your salary. Well, they modified the withholding tables. So people were taking home a little bit more money in many cases per paycheck. Of course, in other cases, some people said uh, they weren't getting anything. Why? Because the employer raised the uh, amount they had to contribute to the company health insurance plan. I mean, there was one thing, uh, I saw this in the news about a woman writing a letter to then Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, thanking him for the extra 50 cents a week she was getting in her paycheck. Okay, so more money, less money being withheld, so they're taking home more money during the year. What's the trade-off on that? Less tax return. Hmm? What? More tax refund. Well, now what, what? Who said more? Who said more? Less of a refund? More tax said, refund. What? More tax refund. Much more at the end of the year. <clears throat> Give that man a gold star. Yeah. <clears throat> because that's exactly what happened. People found out that they were getting less back or in some cases they actually ended up owing because they didn't have enough withheld. Now, 2018 was the first year, and that modification did not take place, did not take place until the end of February. 2019, you've had a full year with the reduced withholding rates. Now, most people, again, who here gets, generally gets a refund every year from their federal return? Don't be shy, show your hands, come on, okay? Was it a little bit less this year? Um, yeah, a little. A little, okay. Well, here's the thing. Most people, it doesn't matter how much their refund is, but everybody expects a re most people expect a refund, okay? 
The problem is, is that they already have that money spent. They don't know how much it is, they don't know when they're getting it, but they already know what they're doing with the money. I mean, what, what, is, what time of year is this? Holiday season. Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa. Did, any other, did I miss any holiday? I mean, uh, the Chinese New Year is coming up in January, right? Okay, a lot of gifts. Spending a lot of money. So some people will take their refund to pay off the holiday bills. Other people will use that money for buying a new car, a home improvement, the family vacation, the kids' summer camp, whatever it is. Now there's less of it. Uh, as I tell people, and again, this is not something that Jessica knows, but my bachelor's, I am a dull, boring CPA with a bachelor's degree in theater. I spent seven years pursuing an acting career. This is the truth, God's honest truth. You couldn't tell? <laughs> okay, but no, but when you work on a movie, uh, if you work as an extra, the people in the background, you have to fill out a pay voucher every day because every day is different because you got your base pay and then depending on how much overtime, there, how late you worked beyond when you got into overtime because the first two hours were a time and a half, after that it was double time, if it was a rainy scene, they had to create a, like a rainy scene, that's rain pay, you got, ex you got something extra for that. They, if you were in a movie that took place say in the, at a USO in the 1940s during World War II, well back then almost everybody smoked and everybody smoked indoors, well that's smoke pay, you got something extra for that too. You didn't get your meal break on time, you got something extra for that too. Every, so every day was different, so you had to fill out a pay voucher every day. My father, who was a CPA, said, always put down single zero, let them take out the maximum required. I knew some people who put down single nine. So this way, the only thing that got deducted was Social Security, Medicare, the FICA tax, the contributions to the SAG Pension Welfare Fund, and that was about it. I don't know what the situation was at the end of the year, but in my case, again, living up in New York, I always got a federal refund. I always owed New York State some money. But that was always the case for most people. You know, you got back from the federal, you owed to the state, because remember, certain things you can deduct on the federal, like state income taxes, you can't deduct that against your, uh, on your state return. But it was still very easy. But you look here, as you see, these tax brackets are not that big a difference. I mean, from 28 to 24, the fourth bracket, that is the biggest one, 4%. Okay? This tax bill was designed to help the wealthy, not so much the middle class. And here's another scary thing I'm going to throw out at you. Federal government has a fiscal year end of September 30th. And I'll pre that's why I'm prefacing this. Uh, for the fiscal year that ended in 2018, the federal deficit was $790 billion. Okay? The tax bill said was passed on a simple majority because it did not go beyond a threshold of $1.5 trillion. In other words, over 10 years, it would only add $1.5 trillion to the national debt. For fiscal year September 2018, $790 billion. Fiscal year 2019, anybody care to guess what it was? Do I? How much? Go a little bit higher. How much? Nope. Close. I was predicting a $1 trillion deficit. 984 billion. But you take the 790 and the 984, that's nearly 1.7 trillion dollars. So what they said would take 10 years to do took them two years. And they exceeded it by nearly 20 percent. Now, what is the future of taxes in the country? Sadly, yes. Taxes, unfortunately, have nowhere to go but up. We have been kicking the can, no, the federal government with the debt just keeps kicking the can down the road. Sadly, that's all they do. There's going to come a time where they're going to have to deal with the debt. And why has the debt gone up so much? Well, less money is coming in through withholding, so the government has to borrow more. But now, 
they're going to have sooner or later, unfortunately, taxes that are going to have to go up. Not only that, services, services the governments provide, going to go down. They're going to have to cut back on services. Everybody, do people here remember several years ago the sequester, which was a 10% across the board cutting of everything. And that was every department in the federal government. Now the thing about that was is that you could have a department and they have two programs. One program is very successful, one program is doing nothing. They could not just get rid of the program that was doing nothing. They had to keep all the programs and everything got a 10% across the board cut. So they could not keep, the, so the programs that were working, they could not necessarily keep at full strength. And the ones that were not working, they had to keep going. Does anybody have any questions on any of this? Don't be shy. Remember, asking, remember, the only truly bad question is the one that is not asked. Yes, ma'am. So you mentioned about the C corporation. S yes. Corporation. Do they have a limitation? I say you have to have two people uh, in. No. No. So that's the one only. Reason. Okay. And what you can have a what you can have a single member. A corporation can have just one shareholder, whether it's a C or an S. The only difference is the unincorporated entity. If it is just one person, whether it's a part, whether it's an LLC or not, if it's just one person, you report the income on 1040 Schedule C. You have two or more people, that's when you have to file the partnership return. I think a second question is coming up. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, you're talking about the, <coughs> the income, uh, 157,000. That was on the, that's for the, that was for the qualified business income deduction. Are you a business owner? Me, 1099, consider business owner, right? How do you report your uh, 1099? Do you report on a Schedule C, or do you file an 1120, 1120S, a 1065? I'm just asking. Either of those, it doesn't matter. You would, if you have a profit, you, quali you may qualify for the QBI deduction. That number went up slightly for 2019. I don't have the exact number. Do I have to form a corp? No. If you have a Schedule C, you would still qualify for the QBI deduction. Oh, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Don, will ask a question. Don? So he has a question. You mentioned about the LLC. Um, should we create this in other states? Because I heard Delaware is better because for business owner. But or creating in Florida, what's a positive benefit or negative? Well, the thing is, if you form a corporate, if you form a business entity outside of your home state, you then have to register it in your home state as a foreign corporation operating there. So I don't know if that's necessarily a good idea. If you're in Florida, form a Florida corporation. If you're in New York, form a New York entity. That's my personal philosophy. But you need to sit down and talk with a professional, someone who knows about these, like a CPA or an attorney, somebody who is knowledgeable. I will yes, I will plug for myself, come see me, but you can talk, if you know somebody, go ahead and speak with them. One of the things is, and I have seen this over the years, is that people start a business, they form an entity, but the type of entity, someone says, oh, you should form it like, you should form it as an LLC, or you should do this. You need to sit down and know what the pros and cons are of each type of entity. And that's where somebody who knows the tax law is an asset. Yes, Paul. Yeah, uh, regarding the corporate and the tenant, do mm -hmm. they count golfing yes, and the tenant no more? Yes. They do? Again, okay, but again, buying the hot dogs and the beer from the cart girl, that's deductible. But uh, buying the ticket But the greens fees, no. no. Entertainment. But the meal is okay. The meal is okay. Yeah. I have a, a, a nice you play golf ball? Mm -hmm. my, my client does. Okay. You <laughs> <laughs> learn. Uh, yes, sir. You and then you. Yes, sir. If you have 1099 and uh, all your income is coming from 1099 and you pay you know, self employment taxes from there, you still have can deduct those. Uh, the qualified bit, QBI? Yes, because you're filing a Schedule C, correct? You ask you, well, how else are you, yes, because you, remember, you, you're getting your 1099, you're an independent contractor, so you get a 1099 miscellaneous. 
So you have all those. You have that's your income. Then you have your expenses against that income. You have your profit. Your profit would be subject would uh, be subject to the QBI. Okay. Yes, sir. For like uh, small business, for example, as corporation LLC, uh, I heard some people mention like you can uh, can you count in traveling as expenses. Travel. Uh -huh. but travel is so deductible. Yes. What yes. about the traveling? You know, for example, uh, some people say they can uh, reimburse the traveling as a company. You know, annual board meeting stuff. It's maybe board meeting, area. board meeting. Yeah, this is some people that say they go to go to Orlando for for a week, and really a lot of activities. It's kind of gray gray area. Yeah, you're getting in the gray. You're getting in the gray area. No, if you're going to have a board meeting, there's a valid. You have to have. A, let's let's. Uh, you're getting into the gray area. You really have to have a valid reason <clears throat> for going to Orlando. If you're going up there to see clients, that's okay. If you're just going up there and it's you and your wife, you're the, it's your business and you're the board, the two of you, for example. Hmm, I don't. She's laugh. This she's laughing at that, but it's that's tough. I mean, I mean, if you were a business and you were in Florida and somebody else was based in California and somebody in Illinois, somebody in New York, and you're all getting together in Orlando for a, to get to, you know, for a face-to-face -face powwow, then we're talking, that's something a little more legitimate. You know, a, a, someone who prepares tax returns for a living knows what you can do and what you really shouldn't. Because remember something, here's the important thing. If you, get that, if you get that letter from the IRS saying, hey, why don't you come down and let's talk about your tax return, okay? You need to defend yourself. You need to, you need to say that this is legitimate or not. Now, does that, now, let me ask a question here. Does anybody here prepare their return on their own? Okay. Uh, one thing that's very important, uh, this past week, was Tax Awareness Security Week by the IRS. You may have seen something about it on the news in the paper. I actually spoke at a press conference down at my, in Miami Dade about it. And you know, a couple of things are you know, holiday season, be very careful about your credit cards and things you do online. Hackers are everywhere. Be very careful. I spoke about the importance of uh, tax returns that make sure that the preparer you use is somebody who is Legitimate. Important thing that somebody is legitimate. Do they have a look at your tax return? Let's go back to the tax return. Go give me a moment. Uh, okay, that's okay. If you look down, oh, okay. Let's actually go here because it's there. Like you see right here. You know, it's a little hard to see, but you see the box I'm pointing at. Right above it, you see like four little letters. I know it's a little hard to see it. You know what that says there? That's PTIN, Preparer Tax Identification Number. Okay? A, pay, a paid preparer has one of those. The PTIN was created by the IRS about 20 years ago as an alternative identification of a paid preparer. Prior to that, the preparers had to put their, per I had to put my personal social security number there. Well, why should everybody have my social, my, why should my social security number appear on all these other forms? So they created that. Then about 10 years ago, the Internal Revenue Service decided they were going to regulate preparers. Okay? Well, they said, we're going to make the PTIN the sole identification of a preparer. Fine. Well, they were challenged. They were challenged. And there was a case in 2012, Loving v. IRS, where the courts ruled that the IRS had overstepped their bounds in unilaterally trying to regulate preparers. Well, they appealed, they lost, and they have now been waiting for Congress to pass legislation to give them the authority to regulate on their own. There are a few states, uh, California, Oregon, and, Michigan, and uh, Maryland, I believe, that do regulate, that do have some regulating of preparers. The rest of the states do not. Now, in my, over the years, some, every now and then somebody new comes to me. They bring me last year's return and I look at the signature block. 
over here where all my information is. You know what it says in there sometimes? Self-prepared. So then I asked the person, Jessica, did you prepare your tax return last year? Her answer is no. And then I say, well, you see this? It says you did. Here's the thing. If you get that call from the IRS to come down and talk about your personal return, and it says self-prepared, and you use somebody to prepare it, you're on your own. You are held to the same standard as a professional. Because you self it was marked self-prepared. Be very wary of somebody who, you no, know, make sure that whoever you use has a PTIN. Make sure they do not put in self-prepared. If you pay them, you want their information on the return. More importantly, you know how in about a month we're going to see all those little signs at the corners which says, get back $2,500 per dependent or whatever? If, some, if you see that, or if you go somewhere where they say, I guarantee you're going to get money back, and how much, don't use them. <laughs> Seriously, nobody, one, can guarantee you will get a refund, and two, no one can guarantee that if they say you'll get a refund, how much that refund will be. You know, on the tax return, there are some things that are black and white. Other things, depending on your individual situation, have shades of gray. So, yes? Regarding this, and what kind of uh, uh, tips you can give to all of us? Perhaps I would imagine some business owners, they are very familiar with certain tax return. So any like one to two questions uh, can help us to ask or identify who are more qualified <coughs> tax preparers or CPAs? Um, you know, what kind of one to three questions we can ask to identify? Okay, do they have, if they're, first of all, if they're a CPA, remember, if, oh, oh, before I answer that, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give everybody a little scary thing I'm going to add there. I was in Washington back in September at a meeting at the Internal Revenue Service. And they were talking about, you know, October, November is when people have to renew their PTINs. You have to renew it every year. Okay? Last year, there were 777,000 PTINs across the country. Okay? People who were not a CPA or an attorney or an enrolled agent who did not have one of those designations accounted for 62% of the PTINs. That is half a million, nearly half a million people preparing tax returns, personal tax returns, and there is no oversight for them. No, if I'm preparing somebody's return in this room and you feel that I am making and I make some egregious mistakes and I do that for let's say I'm doing several people in this room and you all get IRS letters that there were mistakes on your return and I made the mistakes well you can file a complaint about me with the Florida Board of Accountancy if it's somebody if it's in New York State it's the New York State Department of Education uh, if it's an attorney, there's the state bar. So the state bar. If it's an enrolled agent, well, that's an IRS designation. You can complain about this person to the IRS. Half a million people, you can't complain about at all. There is nobody to go to. Now, yes, you may come to me this year, and you may say, well, my fee was too high, or you didn't like how I did things, and you might find somebody else to go to next year. That happens to everybody who prepares returns. There's always going to be a few, somebody new this year, come, come in one year, and they're gone the next. But if people are doing things egregiously, you have to have someone to report to. Now, Jessica asked about what tax tips can you give for a business owner. Well, for the business owners, what you should be doing at some point during the year is talking with whoever prepares the business return. Go over your numbers. See how you're doing. Remember, if you're a business owner, who here owns a business? Show of hands, come on, don't be shy. Okay, who here is it? Uh, those who raise hands, are you a subchapter S corporation? Yes? What, do you, what return do you file? 1065, 1120s 1120S. You don't know? Ooh, you need to know. Let's use 1120S, which is the S corporation, okay? S corporation, I use that because you can take a salary from an S corporation. So if you're <coughs> business owner, you draw a salary, you get a W-2 at the end of the year. 
you get the business return done, you get the K-1 at the end of the year. Those are your two pieces of income. What is the big difference between the two? The W-2 has withholding taxes. The K-1 does not. So you should be talking with your person, whoever it is, about should you be taking, no, at that point, if the year is going well, should you be taking more salary or should we have a modification in your estimates? With the individual clients, I say the same thing. I tell them all the time, if something happens during the year, let us know when it happens. So, for example, anybody here ever win something on the lottery? Scratch off ticket, anything. I win five bucks, four bucks, two bucks, means nothing. But let's say I won, let's say somebody here won $50,000 on a scratch-off ticket, okay? <clears throat> what do you do? You tell, you contact your preparer and you tell them you've got this extra money coming in. Because now you can sit down with them, they will sit to, have them sit down with you, see what you need to do if anything. When you cash, the, when you cash in the winning tic that ticket, will they do any withholding? How much should they withhold? Should you modify your withholding from work? Should you make estimated tax payments? Esti remember, an estimated tax payment. Who here, anyone here pay estimated tax payments during the year? No? Well, estimated tax payments, there are guesses to what your liability is. That's for people who do not have a job where they have taxes withheld, where they have a lot of retirement money, they have interest, and they have dividends. You can always modify the estimated tax payments up or down depending on your individual situation. The most important thing is you go to them during the year. You go to them when it happens. Do not wait until the following March and say, Neil, hey, I won $50,000 last year on a scratch-off ticket. Hey, that's $50,000 more income. Did they have, do any withholding on that? I don't know. Because you can't say, how much tax am I going to pay on this one particular thing? You have to look for tax purposes at the entire picture. All your income, what are your deductions, best case scenario, worst case scenario. Who here would rather be told they're getting money back versus owing? Don't go on. I mean, nobody here cares? Okay. Well, if something happens during the year, that's why it's important to speak with your preparer, whether it's your business, whether it's personal, if something happens. I had a client come in the other day to go over her situation to see if there's anything that she should be doing between now and the end of the year. Now granted, it is uh, December 7th, you only have about three and a half weeks left, but you can still meet with your preparer if you feel it is necessary to do so. I encourage you to do so if that is what you think. No, you get who here has investments? No one has investments. Everybody's, okay? Uh, Always, no, you get, those, you get those monthly reports, sit down with your advisor. I get calls from financial advisors at this time of year for clients with investments. Uh, they want to know or confirm if they have any carry forward capital losses. Uh, capital losses, selling of stocks and bonds and mutual funds. If you have capital losses can only be used to offset capital gains. But if your losses exceed your gains, you're allowed to take up to $3,000 a year against ordinary income. Everything else gets carried forward and until you use it up, they keep get ca getting carried forward. So some will call me to say, does John Smith have carry forward losses? How much are they? Because then they will look to see if there's anything they can sell to uh, you use the losses to offset if they're looking to uh, give them some extra cash. And if they don't have any carry forward, then they have to see if there's anything they can sell because they see these people have huge capital gains and they want to try and minimize them. Make sense? Makes sense. Yes. Good. Anybody have any other questions? Well, yes, ma'am. Because you do the auditing as well, I just wonder if, you know, if people get audited, yes. they say they own a certain amount of tax. Is it Good idea to find somebody who in this kind of service or just go ahead and pay for it? I mean, if you're going to be ordered by the IRS? Right. Well, usually most people, if they have a paid preparer, they will pay them to represent them at the audit, help them to represent them at the audit. Mm -hmm. well, what's the outcome normally? It, depe can't, you can't, it depends on the situation. I, I 
One of my, one, uh, my, yeah, my father's a CPA, and about 50 years ago, for a corporation, he handled an international audit. And he convinced the auditor to pick, uh, the, they were auditing three years. He convinced them to take one year, pick one year of the three, whatever you find will triple it and be done. The auditor agreed. He picked the one year, the final result, no change. Gesundheit. Other times, they have, other times they feel they have to come away with something. I handled an audit for a client a number of years ago up in New York. So the, they audited him. They got it. He has a Schedule C. What did they do? They cut his meals and entertainment in half. No big, nothing big. Okay? Three years later, and this does happen, sometimes he got the, the audit letter again. Because sometimes they will check on you to make sure you're being in compliance. So when I met with him the day before we were going to the IRS office, he says, I know what they're going to find on me. And, he was, and that was the only thing they found. He had a business line of credit. He was making monthly payments. He thought the payments were all interest. But they weren't. They were interest and principal. And that was the only thing they found. So every, again, an audit, I cannot, if you get audited, I cannot guarantee you will owe money. I cannot guarantee you will walk away with no change. Mm -hmm. It's the individual situation. Right. I, I believe, but the normally, what's the situation? It's about the medical. Everything, is, everyone is different. You can't answer that. Okay. And just so you know, because of all the cutbacks, mm -hmm. the number of people getting audited are down. Mm -hmm. It's really now very hot. People with extreme, very high wealth are more likely getting audited. Businesses are probably about the same, but the average taxpayer, it, again, it depends on the individual situation. If you have a Schedule C versus not have, if you have a Schedule C, capital, you know, business, a small business, personal return, there's a greater chance you might get audited than if you don't have one. I will say that. Because they're looking to make sure what you're... Yes, sir. You mentioned an example of uh, winning the strike uh, ticket lottery. Yes. You win something like you know, $50,000. What, well, what can you do to reduce your tax liability? Well, you really can't reduce the liability on that because that's $50,000. What you have to do is find out, and that's why you... You know, there's a certain period of time before... You have, you have time once you find out you went to claim the t to go in and claim the winnings. So the first question is, what does the state withhold? Will they, will they do any automatic withholding? Can you increase that withholding? What imp and then, of course, what, sitting down with your preparer, what impact does this extra $50,000 do? Does that jump you into the next tax bracket, for example? How much, how much would that, based on the information we can, you can glean, Will that increase your potential liability? The ideal, because the idea is to cover your liability as much as possible. The ideal tax return for an individual or anything where the, you have to pay tax is that whatever you've paid in is equal to your liability. That if your liability is $5,000, that you had paid in through withholding and estimates $5,000, a break even. Said, so that, that's why we, when we talk about the refunds, some people say, well, why are you getting a refund? You know, you, don't you know that that's basically an interest-free loan to the government? Which it is. But again, would you rather get money back or would you rather owe? The problem today is that most people with their take-home pay, their disposable income, that's exactly what happens. It all gets disposed. Now you have this, ex and we all have this. All of a sudden, something happens in our lives. Our car breaks down. We blow it. Uh, we're making a turn, and we hit the curb, and we blow out two tires. Now we have to get the tires fixed, and whatever damage we did to the car. And act. How much is that going to cost? Do we have the money to pay that? Do we set aside in our monthly budgets, you know, paying off the credit cards and or other unanticipated expenses? Same thing with the refund. You want to make sure that you're covered. You want to cover your liability. And again, clients like people like getting money back. I have clients who say, I don't care what whatever you do, I don't care how much I have to pay in, I just don't want to owe in April. Period. So they don't care if they pay more during the year. They just don't want to owe in April. They want money back. And they don't care if it's ten bucks or uh, ten bucks or a hundred bucks or five hundred dollars. They just want money back. Okay. Uh, two more questions and then we got to, sir, uh, 
So and then, yeah. Well, what's the tax funding difference between LLC and S corporation? An LLC and an S corp? Well, okay, an S corporation does not pay federal tax. An LLC does not pay federal tax. The tax is pa the tax liability, the income passes through to the shareholders, the partners, and they pick it up on their returns. Now, an LLC does have an option of being treated as an S corporation. It always has that. It has that option. So again, depends on the individual situation. For auditing, uh, is that like you made a correction? Uh, how is that six years period of time? Once you pass six years, and so whatever it is is the same with IRS, right? Okay. Well, basically, if you get called in for an audit, the IRS can go back three years automatically. Three years automatically. However, depending on what they find there, they can go back another three. Okay. If they want to go back beyond six years, they have to prove fraud. Okay. And if they prove fraud, then you know how far they can go back? 1913. Lifetime. Oh. No, the reason I say 19, the reason I say 1913 okay. is because that's when the current Internal Revenue Code was Sorry. first established. <laughs> Correct. So, uh, la yes, Andy. Yeah. Is this uh, any law they uh, the uh, business owner have to withhold certain amount of the uh, tax. I'm sorry? He withhold some certain amount. Uh, I mean from the salary? Yeah. Yes, there's a law. There's a publication that comes out every year from the IRS that says based on, based on how often you pay, how many exemptions you're claiming, this is how much you're being paid between A and B, you have to withhold X amount of dollars. So like a business owner? No, uh, that they have to withhold? You mean for paying corporate taxes? No, not corporate tax. Like, are we getting from uh, 1099? Okay. That, well, that's estimated taxes. Do you don't have, do you have, do you, have, have do, uh, you should because if you don't pay in enough during the year, and even if you pay in, you can get, no, you can get hit with penalties. There is a, there is a failure to fa pay penalty if you don't have enough withheld. Normally, to avoid underpayment penalties, you have to pay in either the equivalent of last year's liability or 90% of the current year's liability. This year they reduced it because of the change in tax law to 80%, but it's going back to 90% next for the 2019 returns. So what's a penalty? Uh, it depends on the amount that you owed. And now that uh, a dollar amount. I can't go, no. Okay. They, have, they have to compute. So can be right. <laughs> It can, it, heavy. it can be heavy. <coughs> and remember, they're not, it's, remember, it's penalties plus interest. Now, one thing I'll give everybody one piece of advice, and this is something that a preparer knows. If you get hit with a penalty of any kind, and this is the first time that's happened, we can, you can contact the IRS and request a penalty abatement. They will abate the penalty, but not the interest. But you've got, but you can't have any issues like say in the previous three years. They look back three years at a time. So that's like a forgiveness, one time. Well, one time forgiveness, oh, yes. One time forgiveness. But you can do it every three years. Because oh. every three years you can ask forgiveness one time, but do not often use it because otherwise you will, f you will flash the flag, uh, the red flag, and then you're gonna get trouble. But talk about the auditing. So many years ago when I was single, they audited me. I, I was I, w I paralyzed. Fortunately, one of my colleagues, uh, he's a CPA back then, so I hand this letter to, to this gentleman, and he said, don't worry, let me make a phone call. So it's just a simple phone call, and then he squared out my problem because it was an IRS mistake. So just, just do the right thing for mm -hmm. yourself or for your money. Always do the right thing. You don't want to mess up with, with the IRS. Perhaps you want to mess up with the FBI or CIA, but not the IRS. Or the KGB. <laughs> No but, no, but seriously, the IRS, you know, sometimes they do make mistakes. Yeah, you know, sometimes a client gets, you know, when a client gets a letter yeah. from the IRS, they call me and say, Neil, I got a letter. I say, okay, send me the letter. Yeah. Let me read the letter, see what's there. Sometimes they get, they, there's one notice called the CP2000 notice. If you look, when you get the letter from the IRS, it always, there's always like in the very top, in the upper right hand corner, there's information. The first thing, the first line is what type of a notice it is. A CP2000 is when you didn't report something, but they got a 1099. You know, every W2, every, no, your W2s go to Social Security Administration, who after they process their copy, 
that's available to the IRS. Every 1099 for interest, dividends, capital gains, and so forth that you get goes directly to the IRS. They match things up. And if they say, we don't have a match, they send you a letter. And sometimes it's there on your return, but they missed it. So the point is that to summarize everything, sound like to us, you want to take the best tax advantages is W-2 or 1099, or maybe combination of both. So if you have no choice that you are employed and you receive 100% of W-2, and we invite you the opportunity to talk to the people who have invited you today, and we are perhaps able to help you to create a 1099 opportunity to allow more money to be kept in your pocket. Uh, so with that, I know, uh, anybody else? One more question? <laughs> well, it's, uh, everyone, I thank you all for your time. Thank you, Neil. So, yeah. Was this uh, information very helpful? Yes. I know it's very, very informative, and Neil really you know, pour your heart to help us.